This program, while curated to help you improve your health, contains general advice and should not replace the individual advice of your medical practitioner. Endometriosis is not a hormonal condition. The solution to having termites in your house isn't to blow up your house. That's really what we're doing with women with endometriosis. The main strategy for endometriosis is to treat the immune dysfunction that lies at the heart of the disease. I would like to call to arms for women around the world to know that their intuition isn't lying to them. So if you have been diagnosed with endometriosis, I would say it's not going to define your life. In life, it's normal to have ups and downs. But what do we do when we get stuck? I've always been fascinated by the healing journey. Why do some people get better while others fail to make the shift? In season two of The Shift, we explore the intricate world of women's health and help you discover how to balance your hormones and understand yourself better so that you can truly thrive. The menstrual cycle is a vital sign of female well-being. My mum just used to say, oh man, I'm so sorry, it's part of being a woman. I would like to call to arms for women to know that their intuition isn't lying to them. I'm Catherine Maslin and this is The Shift. In the last episode of The Shift, we discussed period pain and its many causes. Endometriosis is one of them, and we're going to take a look at this increasingly common condition in this episode. Endometriosis is a condition in which the cells and tissues that belong on the inside of your uterus, your endometrial lining, grows in places outside of the uterus. Most commonly, this occurs in the pelvic cavity, on places like the ovaries outside of the uterus, the bladder and the pelvic wall. In the West, it is estimated that at least 11% of women suffer from endometriosis at some point in their life. For many of these women, pain severely impacts their quality of life and each month is an ongoing battle to manage the condition. Endometrial cells end up in the pelvic cavity by a process called retrograde menstruation, which means that you have some amount of menstrual blood that spills out of the fallopian tubes when you're bleeding. If you're not too familiar with your reproductive organ anatomy, Find a quick picture on Google, and what you'll see is that your ovaries and fallopian tubes are actually not connected. There's an open space where the fallopian tube meets the ovary, which can allow for this menstrual blood to come through. It is thought that retrograde menstruation is quite normal, but there's something about women who go on to develop endometriosis that allows these cells to take hold, grow, and replicate. We're going to explore some of the theories behind this in this episode. What makes it more confusing is that in rare cases, endometriosis has been found in places outside of the pelvis, where technically speaking, endometrial cells should not be able to directly migrate. Endometriosis has been found in the chest cavity, heart, breast, and the gastrointestinal tract. This has led to further research about the cause of endometriosis, and there are some interesting findings that we'll talk about in this episode. First up, I talked to Dr. Lara Bryden about the condition. Dr. Bryden is a naturopathic doctor specialising in women's health. There has been an increase in the frequency of endometriosis. I think that's pretty clear from the research. There's been a frequent, an increase in the diagnosis of the condition, but also the severity of it and the frequency of it. And I think with regard to endometriosis in particular, I think what's driving that is a combination of epigenetic changes from previous generations exposure to environmental toxins like dioxins. So what that means is that a woman who was exposed potentially, like her her mother or her grandmother was exposed to something that altered immune function in the way that by the time you know she's born and her menstrual cycles kick in, that she's got a more active inflammatory response. There's also the role of the microbiome. I think our modern microbiome problem and frequency of intestinal permeability, whether it's due to SIBO or dysbiosis, is also driving this disease. So right away, you can see that endometriosis has a lot of complexity going on, and we're going to explore these underlying issues more as we move through this episode. You might think that endometriosis is caused by your hormones, but the research doesn't really show this. Have a listen to how Dr. Lara Bryden explains. Endometriosis is not a hormonal condition. It's not a period problem, although it manifests with period symptoms. But fundamentally, endometriosis is an inflammatory disease. 
in the same category as diseases of immune dysfunction like inflammatory arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease, which is why, you know, trying to treat endometriosis with contraceptive drugs has been such a dead end <laughs> because they can't, they can sometimes suppress the disease process to some extent, but hormonal birth control in no way does anything to correct the underlying disease process of endometriosis. It's an inflammatory disease that has a, quite a strong genetic component, which is why endometriosis runs in families. Some women would just never get endometriosis, even if everything else went wrong, you know, with their pelvic microbiome, you know, their high estrogen, even if everything was stacked against them, they would still never get the disease because they don't have that genetic tendency. So it's very much that kind of condition. Endometriosis is an inflammatory disease with an epigenetic component, which means you know, certain genes probably in the immune system have been switched on in you know, previous generations due to exposure to environmental toxins such as dioxin. And then when that dysfunctional pelvic immune system meets a problem with the pelvic microbiome, which seems to be what's emerging as a, a major factor in endometriosis, the result is an active inflammatory disease process in the pelvis, but it can, endometriosis can actually occur outside of the pelvis, but usually in the pelvis, that are active inflammatory lesions that invade tissue, create a, a nerve supply that can create quite a lot of pain and scar tissue. It's a terrible disease. It's a devastating disease. And the way forward with endometriosis, I think is a complete, you know, back to the drawing board for medicine. This strategy of cutting it out and then kind of hoping for the best with contraceptive drugs is not working for a lot of women. Sometimes surgery done properly, it's what they call excision surgery. If you get lucky enough to remove all of the endometriosis lesions, that can have a good outcome. Certainly that can mean the disease process can be put in remission, sometimes forever, at least for a longer term. That's good when that can happen. But for a lot of women, the surgery doesn't fix the problem of endometriosis because the lesions just grow back. You know, if, if the inflammation, if the immune dysfunction of the disease is not addressed, then you just get the disease coming back. This is where, while laparoscopic surgery may be necessary, especially given that it is both diagnostic and a treatment for the condition, it may not be a complete solution. This is because the driving factors that cause the endometriosis, such as inflammation and immune dysregulation, are still present, leading to a high recurrence rate. With properly done surgery for endometriosis, the recurrence rate is only about 50%. Only 50%, you know, which does mean at least 50% of women. You can get good long-term outcomes from surgery, but... The problem is what we really don't want to see happen is women having surgery after surgery for endometriosis because everyone agrees that is not a good outcome because the surgery itself can cause scar tissue adhesions that can contribute to pelvic pain. So, you know, maybe one properly done surgery and then if that's not working, there, there has to be another strategy. From a naturopathic perspective, the main strategy for endometriosis is to treat the immune dysfunction that lies at the heart of the disease. That's Fortunately, now starting to become a bit more clear from the research that there are some very specific, very unusual things going on with the immune system, that there's some very unusual things going on with the microbiome with this disease. Specifically, what we're seeing is very high levels of gram-negative bacteria or E. coli in the pelvis, not in the intestine. Well, in the intestine, obviously, that's where they're starting, but they potentially translocating from the gut into the pelvis. And when that lipopolysaccharide or gram-negative bacteria is in the pelvis together with estrogen, together with the genetic and the epigenetic immune dysfunction, that's the perfect storm for these lesions, endometriosis lesions to get going and cause pain. And so what the research is showing is the presence of the gram-negative bacteria, potentially the importance. There was a pretty interesting animal study that came out in, I think, 2018 that found that giving a certain type of antibiotic one that you know, was effective against that strain of bacteria dramatically reduced the size of endometriosis lesions in animals. Now, that has not been translated into human trials at this stage. And so certainly there's no doctor that's going to prescribe an antibiotic for endometriosis at this stage. 
but I suspect that's the future of treatment for this for endometriosis. For years, as a clinician, I've been treating endometriosis with antimicrobial herbal medicines that are aimed at, for example, like a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or a SIBO situation, which is extremely common with endometriosis. That overgrowth of the gram-negative bacteria in the small intestine, potentially translocating to the pelvis. And if you can knock back the levels of those bacteria, you can make inroads into reducing pain, dialing down that inflammatory response. There's always going to then need to be some kind of maintenance situation in place, which involves ticking all the boxes to keep the immune system happy and the immune system not in an active inflammatory state. The allopathic treatment of endometriosis involves surgery and the use of contraceptive or hormonally active drugs to try and suppress the tissue growth. Given the complexity of this issue, this may not be enough to help you to heal. It is also worth mentioning that there are many levels of endometriosis occurrence. You can have mild versions with very few lesions to widespread severe endometriosis where the lesions are larger, more widespread and deeper into the tissue. The other interesting thing is that severity does not equal more pain. In fact, some women with endometriosis have no pain and others have tiny amounts and high levels of pain. This may come down to some of the factors we discussed in the previous episode. Dr. Peter Wright is a holistic gynaecologist specialising in fertility and pelvic pain. I asked her to explain how endometriosis develops. So endometriosis is a condition where cells that are like the endometrial cells that line the the inside of the uterus grow in other parts of the body, most commonly in the pelvis, so around the ovaries, sometimes on the bowel and the bladder, on the walls of the pelvic side walls and things. There are various theories about how it happens. Basically, about 90% of women will have some blood come out of the fallopian tubes when they have a period and go into the pelvis, but about 10% of women will develop endometriosis. And endometriosis is those deposits that grow in the pelvis. So we think that for women who don't develop endometriosis, their bodies clear those cells and just deal with them and it's not a big deal. For women who do develop endometriosis, something happens with their immune system. So yes, it's hormonally mediated. So because those cells act like the cells inside the uterus, which respond to estrogen, so they grow when estrogen rises and they generally uh, dissipate when progesterone rises, those deposits inside the pelvis will do the same thing. So it is hormonally mediated, which is often why hormonal treatments like the pill or the Mirena are often used because it can cause those cells to regress and stop them bleeding and things. We think that it's an immune dysfunction issue at the heart of it. And what causes the immune dysfunction, we don't know. It can be environmental. It could be um, genetic, so epigenetics, how environment affects genes. could be bacterial. We know that there's more gram-negative bacteria in the pelvises of women who have endometriosis and there's a particular substance that's released from those bacteria called lipopolysaccharides or LPS, which can cause or induce inflammation. So we think what's happening with women who have endometriosis is that they have something impaired with their immune system, their body overreacts to those little endometriosis deposits and causes out of control inflammation. And then the innate part of the immune system doesn't clean that up. So you sort of get unbridled inflammation and then that inflammation causes pain. So that's prostaglandins and other inflammatory little chemicals, which activates our nerve cells, activates our pain pathways. Some women who have deep deposits of endometriosis actually get new little neural networks that grow into the deposit, which can also cause pain. And then you have the pain from the pelvic muscles, the pain pathways, the um, stress of the having the pain. Also, IBS and bowel symptoms are very common with women with endometriosis. And perhaps it's just because everything's all in there together and the same nerve pathways are you know, involved. It might be because of women who have an environmental insult, like an inflammatory something that causes leaky gut or SIBO or IBS, then, you know, causes inflammation. That might be where that gram-negative bacteria comes from, if that is part of the endometriosis etiology. But the basic thing is, if you've zoned out of anything else that I've said, is that endometriosis isn't just a 
pelvic disease. It's a whole body underlying inflammatory immune system disease, a bit like an autoimmune disease, although it hasn't been classified as that. And so it's important when you're dealing with endometriosis that you're dealing with it from a very holistic point of view. Reviews help us know that we're hitting the mark with what you need and help us to shape future seasons. I'd really appreciate it if you could take a few moments to leave us a review. I would love to know what you think. The shift! You're beginning to hear some themes here and you'll notice our experts sharing some of the same information in different ways. We've included this to help you grasp some of these concepts that can sometimes be a little bit confusing. Dr. Felice Gersh is an integrative gynaecologist who has been researching endometriosis for some time. What she says really fleshes out what we've been talking about and adds another layer of complexity to the situation. So endometriosis is a complex condition that has some similarities and differences. It's interesting that actually women with PCOS have higher rates of endometriosis than the general population. And it stems from a a combination of genetic propensity, but now they've linked endometriosis to certain pesticides like dioxins. And these pesticides, when you're exposed in utero, that's a very critical time of life, alter the progesterone receptors. So they found that women with endometriosis have malfunctioning of their progesterone receptors. We talked about with PCOS, it's estrogen, primarily estrogen receptors, but there may also be other receptors, right? So that's why you can have more than one thing in one person. So it could be melatonin, it can be progesterone, but the dominant one in PCOS is estrogen receptor malfunction. In endometriosis, it's progesterone receptor malfunction. When you have a menstrual cycle, the lining has to shed out in its entirety. Well, some of that goes backwards through the tubes. We call that retrograde menstruation. We used to think that that was unique to women with endometriosis. It turns out it's not. It's universal. All women who have a period will have some, I call it like backwash, this retrograde tissue that goes out the fallopian tubes, and it goes into the abdominal or peritoneal cavity. Now, this tissue is dead it's inflamed, it's infiltrated with white blood cells, the inflammatory cells, because the process of sloughing the lining is inflammatory. And at the time that you have your menstrual period, the estrogen is the lowest that it is in the entire cycle. So it's the time of the menstrual cycle when it's the most inflammatory. When you have high levels of estrogen, like at ovulation, that's the most anti-inflammatory. So estrogen modulates inflammation and it controls it. So nature took care of everything when everything is going right. So when you have the spike of estrogen that precedes ovulation, that's very anti-inflammatory. So inflammation is suppressed, which makes sense because you have sperm coming in, presumably, right? So that you get pregnant because you're ovulating and you don't want your immune cells to attack and kill the sperm. So you don't want to have a really high level of inflammation. But when you're getting rid of the lining of the uterus, that is a sloughing and dying. And and so it's an inflammatory state. And at the same time, this dead, yucky tissue is actually coming out your tubes. Well, that, if you don't have the proper controls, will create an inflammatory response in the pelvis. Because remember, your immune cells line every interface. And there are immune cells in the pelvic cavity, like mast cells, waiting for some bad thing to come through the tube, like a sexually transmitted infection, so that it will attack it, right? Because it wants to protect us. So the immune system sees this stuff coming out the tubes and it's like, whoa, what is this? And it activates the mast cells, which have receptors called toll-like receptors for everything. Mast cells will react to everything and anything that tries to get into our body. They're the first responders. So the mast cells see this dead stuff coming in. It's all inflamed and it just, they explode. So some people call endometriosis a variant of mast cell activation because all these mast cells are exploding because all this stuff is coming in. And then the mast cells call in the troops. They have what they're called chemokines and they call in all the other inflammatory cells and they create this huge inflammatory reaction. And all of this inflammation is going on and estrogen is made in the pelvis. It's made in many sites. So estrogen is made in the pelvis to modulate inflammation. 
and it helps control these enzymes that are produced by white cells called matrix metalloproteinases. And estrogen is about healing and nurturing. So when you have inflammation, it triggers the enzyme aromatase and you make more estrogen. So inflammation triggers the production of estrogen. So now you have this whole inflammatory process going on in the pelvis. So now you're suddenly making all this estrogen, which you shouldn't normally be making all this estrogen. So estrogen is about nurturing and proliferation and growth. So like if you get a big laceration on your arm, on your skin, estrogen is what modulates the healing process. It re regulates the platelets, the growth factors, the creation of new blood vessels, what we call angiogenesis. So estrogen is about growth and proliferation and healing. But estrogen wasn't supposed to be in large quantities in the pelvis during retrograde menstruation. What I'm describing is when things go wrong. So now you have all this estrogen being produced and estrogen doesn't know what endometriosis is. Estrogen isn't used to seeing all this endometrial tissue. So estrogen does what it's designed to do. It tries to heal and nurture. So instead of killing these endometrial cells that are some of the cells that come back through the tube, the retrograde menstruation are living cells. So it doesn't know what it's doing. It thinks it's helping you. So it nurtures those endometrial cells and it helps them to grow and create new blood vessels. That's the implantation of endometriosis. So the immune cells are not properly controlled and the body wasn't designed for estrogen to be produced in large quantity in the pelvic cavity when you have a menstrual cycle and you have the period blood coming back through the tubes with the endometrial cells. So what is supposed to happen? This is what happens in a woman with endometriosis. So every time she has a menstrual cycle, she gets this crazy inflammatory response in her pelvis and she gets all these, the lining cells coming in, and then she has this extreme abundance of production of estrogen locally in response to the inflammatory response, and the estrogen being designed to nurture and grow and cause new blood vessels and stuff, it's actually contributing to the production of endometrial implantation and supporting the endometrial tissue that's growing abnormally in the pelvis. But nature had a plan for all of this. It turns out that when you have the spike of progesterone, the progesterone receptors that exist in the pelvis involving the immune cells actually control the immune cells and calms them down. They're malfunctioning because of exposure to these pesticides in utero. We don't know how to fix it. But if we know that what's supposed to happen is the endocannabinoid receptors are supposed to be activated, maybe we can skip the progesterone part and go straight to the endocannabinoid receptors and use a phony endocannabinoid to actually get things going and talk to the mast cells and say, mast cells, calm down. And there's actually some data just coming out now that this is something beneficial. So it's not fixing the underlying problem, which we always would rather do, but like with PCOS, I don't know how to recreate new receptors, but I have workarounds. And so I call this another workaround for women with endometriosis. And I think that it's really something exciting that we've discovered the role of the endocannabinoid system on the immune cells, like mast cells, and the role that it plays in endometriosis as a new way of treating women with endometriosis. And if we are thinking early, like I just had a patient this week who's in her early teens and has had periods for like just like three years, and she has horrendous periods. I don't know if she has endometriosis. I'm not doing surgery on her, but I can give her some, which I did, some CBD suppositories to use and then see how that does for her because what I want to do is be proactive, not just reactive, because there's nothing I can do for someone who has advanced stage four endometriosis, where everything is adhesed to everything. She has big endometriomas. I mean, I can help, but I can't bring her back to a state of pristine, normal pelvic anatomy. I don't have that power. So we have to be really proactive and think about endometriosis in every young woman who has horrendous menstrual cramps or she has pain with intercourse. You know, we have to do really good pelvic exams, get ultrasounds. If there's 
any question of endometriosis, we don't have to rush everyone into the operating room because studies have shown that doing surgery actually doesn't change the long-term outlook for these women. But of course, it can do harm too. We're putting them through surgery and we can create adhesions and so on just from our manipulation of things. So we want to try to calm down the immune cells. Understanding endometriosis as an overactive immune response to retrograde menstruation is really key. And then working to calm that immune system through whatever methods that we can. You know, I'm thinking of everything that we have, mast cell stabilizers, every, you know, like quercetin and so on. I'm using them all. Everything that I have in my armamentarium, every therapeutic tool to calm down those mast cells. If those mast cells don't explode, and they don't call in all the troops, then you don't have that inflammatory response. You won't get that excessive production of estrogen, which then goes into the supporting of the production of endometrial implants. The solution cannot be what conventional medicine is proposing. You shut down all the hormones of the woman so that they don't have menstrual cycles. Well, it's basically chemical castration. We know women need hormones. The solution to having termites in your house isn't to blow up your house. That's really what we're doing with women with endometriosis. We know that they're having hormonal issues, so we blow up their hormones so they don't have any. That is a terrible solution because we know you need hormones for so many functions in the body, not just reproduction. So we, we're now at least understanding so much more about endometriosis so that we can have much better approaches. And I'm really excited for the future, what may be in store for understanding and then treating endometriosis in a much more sane and effective way. So if you have been diagnosed with endometriosis, I would say it's not going to define your life. This is a condition, yes, it's not a condition that can be cured at this stage. It is a health condition that can be chronic. But when I say that, it might mean you may have flares of time where it might interrupt your life and then other times where it's fine. It's like any other chronic health condition. So asthma or bad hay fever or high blood pressure, other things that can be a chronic condition, but people live with it and they can live and lead beautiful, amazing lives. There's nothing to fear when they know that. And also when they know that there's not just one treatment modality, there's a whole range of things that are, that are options and that may work in combination for that particular person. And if something doesn't work, we can try other things. And that fear is actually a really big player when it comes to pain. So anything that we can do to dial that fear back is important because we have to remember that endometriosis, while it can cause pain, it is associated with pain in some, in many women. It's not going to be life-threatening. It can cause issues with fertility, but if you're managing the inflammation that's ongoing and you're basically doing all of the things that I want any human to be doing, it's just it becomes more important for someone with endometriosis to do it because they're going to feel it in their bodies if they don't then they can live really great lives and, and have a really good team around them. So they've got lots of tools in their toolbox to manage things. And I think when you have that approach and you don't have the unknown, that it becomes less scary. And you, I can understand what's happening inside your body and the things you can do to fix it. And you have power because you actually have a big toolbox of things that you can do to help manage it. When you do have a flare or a bad day, then you're empowered. When you're empowered, you have way less fear because I think fear comes out of feeling hopeless and out of control, which is how many women felt for a long time because all they had was a surgery and that's it. That was great advice from Dr. Peter Wright again. We've explored the concept that endometriosis is a condition of the immune system, but it is influenced by hormones. There's a common misconception that endometriosis is caused by estrogen dominance, which is untrue. While endometriosis is affected by the influence of estrogen because it is hormonally active tissue, the estrogen does not cause the issue. Many women, however, do have excessive estrogen levels and assessing your total hormonal picture is important. At SHIFT, the approach that our naturopaths take with endometriosis is to help to stabilise the immune system, reduce inflammation, work on the microbiome and also address hormonal imbalances. Having excessive oestrogen can be particularly harmful as oestrogen is proliferative, helping the lesions to heal and grow, as Dr. Felice mentioned. This is best tested through comprehensive urinary hormonal screening that can look at your oestrogen metabolism and if it needs correcting. 
Dr. Robin Murphy is a naturopathic doctor with a practice focusing on women and hormonal health. She's also the scientific advisor for DNA Labs and is an expert in genetic testing. I wanted to know what she'd discovered in her work when it came to estrogen metabolism. When it comes to estrogen metabolism, so estrogen is deactivated by certain enzymes within our liver and within the the endocrine tissues. And when it gets deactivated, we really want to make sure that it doesn't retain any estrogenic activity so that even though it may bind an estrogen receptor, it's not causing any downstream effect. You know, we think about estrogen, it's very stimulating. It stimulates growth and reproduction, but we want to make sure we have a control of that. And so through uh, liver metabolism and processing using these different enzymes, estrogen should typically be broken down into a non-estrogenic form and then eliminated from the body. And the way that it's eliminated is through a number of different what are called conjugation reactions. So this is uh, through things like methylation, Uh, People may have heard of this. This is a pathway in the body that is reliant on our B vitamins, particularly folate uh, and B12, but actually a number of different B vitamins and minerals are important for this pathway. So what methylation does is it, it creates the kind of nutrient that the body uses in order to bind to estrogen to make it more water soluble, and then it can get eliminated into the liver out of the bile, out into the bile, and into the stool, as well as through the urine. And so there's different pathways that estrogen will go through. So methylation is one. It can go through glutathione conjugation, uh, sulfation as well. And so these are important ways that the body will help to regulate the amount of estrogen as well as eliminate it from the body. Now, what's fascinating is that there's genetic variations uh, in different enzymes that are shown to alter how estrogen gets broken down. And so this can lead to different forms of estrogen metabolites. So rather than the estrogen being deactivated and no longer having any sort of estrogenic effect, we find that there can be other forms of estrogen metabolites that are shown to retain their estrogenic effect. And there have been studies done to look at the ratios of these different metabolites. Now, there was a lot of science speak in there. And if you're lost, don't worry, you're not alone. Most of us don't need to understand this level of detail. But what I want you to begin to grasp is that there are multiple factors that can interfere with your ability to metabolise hormones. This is why working with a naturopath, integrative doctor, or functional medicine practitioner that understands these areas can really help. For example, you heard Dr. Murphy talking about looking at B12 and folate. And what we'd want to do is screen you for mutations of your MTHFR gene, which can interfere with these nutrients working properly. More on this in episode 13, when we talk about infertility. These are the type of results we can get through testing, and it can really help us to be laser focused when it comes to choosing your treatment. Because Dr. Murphy works in genetics, I wanted to ask her how our genetics played a role in this picture. So a lot of them are shared pathways with liver detoxification. So there's two different pathways that we look at. Uh, One, or what we call phase one detoxification, is through the cytochrome P450 enzymes. So there's tens of different types of enzymes, but the big players here are related to what's called CYP1B1, as well as CYP1A1, CYP3A4, CYP1A2, you know, there's all these acronyms uh, which represent different forms of these enzymes. And so what can happen is through genetic variations, these enzymes can be more predisposed to get turned on more easily. And depending on what they do and how they process the estrogen, this can lead to changes in estrogen metabolites. So we know that there is a particular mutation that can occur within the CYP1B1 enzyme. And this is the enzyme that's important for producing what's called the 4-hydroxy estrogen. So this is the estrogen that retains its estrogenic activity. And there's been studies that have showed that women with breast cancer have higher levels of this 4-hydroxyestrogen within the breast tissue itself 
that is leading to more DNA damage and DNA mutations. And so in addition to changing how the estrogen is getting metabolized, we also see that there's genetic variations which can influence the elimination and detoxification, as well as how well the body is able to protect DNA from the damage. So that is related to enzymes uh, that are utilizing things like glutathione, which is a very strong antioxidant in the body. So glutathione helps to eliminate estrogen as well as to protect DNA from these estrogen quinones, which are very damaging to our DNA and have been associated with things like breast cancer. Interestingly, a lot of the driving forces behind issues like endometriosis also drive breast cancer too. So this screening can be very beneficial so you can be proactive with your health. We're talking about women's hormones, we're talking about autoimmunity, and let's talk about the connection between the two there. I mean, many people on this autoimmune inflammation spectrum, that autoimmunity and those inflammatory problems are impacting the endocrine system. So we see a lot of women with endometriosis and adenomyosis and, of course, Hashimoto's disease or people that are on that spectrum where they're not overtly diagnosable by conventional medicines criteria, but they have these autoimmune components to their hormonal problems. So this collision of their immune system slash inflammation and the endocrine system, the hormonal system, is really a growing issue in our world that many people fall through the cracks of conventional medicine. And because this is impacting women, and just look at all autoimmunity, for the most part, it's way more women than men, with a few exceptions to that, like ankylosing spondylitis, I think is more men than women. But the most autoimmune conditions are impacting women more than men. And of course, female hormone problems are impacting women. So you look at both of those things, that's a lot of women that are going through some major issues and they go to their doctor, their conventional doctor, and with the best of intentions, I'm sure, they're told you're just depressed, you're an antidepressant, or you're just getting older, you just need to live with it. And their intuition knows better. And But yet when you're told you're just depressed or you're told it's you should just settle for it long enough, many people just do. And I want to maybe, like you say, a call to arms. I would like a call to arms for women around the world to know that their intuition isn't lying to them. That it's just because something's common doesn't necessarily mean it's normal. Growing health problems are certainly ubiquitous. It doesn't mean we should settle for it. Growing amount of prescription lists over the course of our life is certainly common, but should we settle for it? And I think that this is this systemic delegitimizing of women is a problem. And just saying, well, it's just you know, you're a hypochondriac or you are, you're worrying too much or you just stress too much. Anybody's going to feel a little bit depressed when they feel this way. Anybody's going to feel stressed when they feel this way. Yeah, they're depressed and stressed, but why? It's because they're going through these real physiological health problems, but they're not even being explored. They're not even being explored largely in conventional medicine. They're just given an antidepressant and told, see you later, largely. Uh, And this is a major, major problem that people are going through. That was integrative doctor, Dr. Will Cole, who really helped to break down the complexity that women face as they're investigating these issues. As we discussed in episode two, the synergy of what is going on with the whole body is just as important as understanding what is happening at the hormonal level. The other area we want to look into is the health of our microbiome. We talked a lot about gut microbes in season one of The Shift, but what about the microbes of your reproductive tract? How do they interact with your gut and other areas? Dr. Lara Bryden touched on this earlier, but let's go a little deeper on this topic. We have a microbiome everywhere. Of course, it's not just the gut microbiome. We have a vaginal microbiome. We have a pelvic microbiome. We have an ovarian microbiome. And those microbiomes do play a role in our reproductive health. I think that a lot of that's still to be learned from future research, you know, how that fits in. The microbiome almost definitely plays a role in endometriosis. Conversely, hormones have a big impact on the vaginal microbiome. So the vaginal microbiome loves estrogen, like seriously loves it. (laughs) Can't get enough of it. 
Estrogen alters the, the gut microbiome, has favorable effects on the microbiome, and actually helps to reduce intestinal permeability by thickening the mucus lining on the inside of the intestine. So that's why women are less likely to develop the metabolic inflammation or the endotoxemia that can you know, be downstream from intestinal permeability. We're sheltered from that to some extent until menopause when we lose estrogen. The vaginal microbiome is healthiest when it's less diverse, which is completely opposite to the gut microbiome, of course, where greater diversity is associated with health. The vaginal microbiome is mostly usually just a couple of spe few species of lactobacillus, which are all fed by glycogen from the vaginal epithelial cells, which produce glycogen when they are stimulated by estrogen, which is one of the main way that estrogen promotes a healthy vaginal microbiome. If you're curious about your hormonal health, take our quiz. You'll get a report with insights into some key areas you need to look at when it comes to getting your hormones in alignment, as well as some handy tips to get you started. Go to theshiftclinic.com forward slash links. I mentioned earlier that many women do tend towards higher levels of estrogen, or estrogen dominance as it's sometimes called. We touched on the fact that abnormalities in our body's ability to detoxify and clear excess estrogen can be a factor. But the other issue that we have is the increasing levels of xenoestrogens in our environment. Dr. Ailey Cohen is an environmental health expert and integrative rheumatologist based in New Jersey. She's collaborated with organisations like the Environmental Working Group and is a wealth of information when it comes to environmental toxicity and its impact on human health. You can't have a conversation about hormonal health without diving into these waters. So I asked her to begin by explaining what EDCs, or endocrine disrupting chemicals, are. Endocrine disruptors, as your audience may know, is really a class of chemicals that have shown the ability to mimic hormones in the human body. More specifically, low-level exposure, uh, similar to estrogens, androgen blocking, which are the male hormones, thyroid effects on thyroid hormones. We have tons and tons of hormones in the human body, which are signalers. And in fact, these chemicals can work to disrupt the normal physiology of these chemicals and the normal receptors to these hormones throughout the body. It's been quite common in the literature that I've been reading that's showing that there's not just better detection as there are for many cancers now that are hormone sensitive, such as breast, ovarian, uterine, and prostate, but there are increasing rates of endometriosis and PCOS, which are very hormonally driven. And so I think as we move forward between the lower, uh, younger ages of onset of puberty and specifically menarche, which is the start of periods in young girls, we're also starting to see this movement towards higher exposure to estrogens. And that can come from pervasive exposure, the ubiquitous exposure to many of these endocrine disrupting chemicals and in everything we do, really. Environmental toxicity is a huge topic, and this is just a taste of what we're going to get into in the next episode of The Shift, where we'll hear more from Dr. Cohen and our other experts. If you suspect that you have endometriosis or you've been diagnosed with the condition, what I really want you to take from this episode is that help is available. Understanding the complexity of what is happening for you is vital. So ensure you build a support team around you that can help you to work on the various aspects of your condition. This means seeing a medical doctor alongside your holistic health team, which could include a naturopath, acupuncturist or emotional wellness support practitioners. Coming up on The Shift. And they found that 170 million Americans had toxic levels of radium in the water supply. The one thing that came up time and time again was pesticides, very strongly correlated with developmental disorders like autism and ADHD. The liver is our detoxification superpower organ. We know estrogens like oral contraceptives, antidepressants, antipsychotics. These have all been identified in post-treatment water. And I said 30 years ago, it won't be a nuclear bomb that wipes us out. It will be infertility. This series is a production of The Shift Clinic. Hosted by Katherine Maslin. 
Music and sound design by Shade Furlong. Thank you to all of our experts. For more details on them, go to theshiftclinic.com. We can be. We must be. The first generation to end extreme poverty. The generation most determined to fight injustice and inequality. The generation that saves the planet from climate change. And this is how we will get it done. The Global Goals. A 15-year plan for everyone, everywhere. everywhere. With no one left behind. The Global Goals are a framework that collectively help us support the health of our people and the planet. At At SHIFT, Shift, we are ambassadors for the Global Goals. This project supports Global Goal number six. Clean water and sanitation. Every time you listen to an episode of The Shift, we provide a day's access to clean water for a human in need in Malawi, Africa. Water Water is the the foundation foundation to health, and and we we believe every human should have access to clean, healthy water. So please share this podcast wide and and keep keep tuning in in so we can impact those who need it the most.